Hello and welcome to the Flix Forum Podcast, where each episode we go back and we look at a Netflix original film in the order of release. This episode we have Netflix 257th film from 2020. It's the crime thriller Offering to the Storm, or in Spanish, Ofrenda a la Tormenta. It's directed by Fernando Gonzalez Molina and stars Marta Etura, Leonardo Spagali, Carlos Librado, Francesco Orella, Emmanuel Ariz, Alvaro Cervantes, and Susie Sanchez. I'm Jesse. I'm here solo for this international film. As always, if you want to check this one out, you've got no idea what it is, give us a pause, come back a little bit later on because we're going to spoil this and we kick off the show with the fast flicks where we do a quick little summary of what the film is all about. So this one, it's about a detective trying to solve a ritualistic case where dead babies are missing from coffins. That's the, the general gist of this one. Um, <laughs> I don't, um, that's a, the, probably the most weird fast flicks that we've ever done on this show because, uh, I mean, who pl- pl- who pitches a, a film with that idea? Um, and obviously we're going to talk about where the actual story comes from through working out how it got to Netflix because this is the third and final installment in a trilogy called the Baztan Trilogy and it follows the film's the Invisible Guardian, and The Legacy of the Bones. And these are based on the best-selling Spanish book series by Dolores Redondo. So um, actually based on her novel and context, I guess I had no idea this was uh, the third film in a series. This uh, includes the work of the German film producer Peter Natterman, who also produced Stieg Larsson's Millennium Trilogy, uh, which you probably may remember um, it had an English adaptation with Daniel Craig. But uh, he picked up the rights for these novels because he could see similarities in uh, in what was going on as well. Um, as with the previous installments that I mentioned, The Invisible Guardian, which came out in 2017, and The Legacy of the Bones from 2019, this film was going to uh, premiere theatrically in Spain on the 27th of March 2020 uh, and then have a streaming release in other countries through Netflix. However, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it just went straight to Netflix, um, including Spain, which means this is a Netflix original worldwide film, and that's why we are covering it on this show. Translations across the world. In Finnish, this is called The Storm Victim. In German, it's called Valley of the Secret Tombs, or it's also called The Nocturnal Visitor. I actually really like that title, Valley of the Secret Tombs, because uh, this is this ties into my fast flicks, I guess, and the, the missing um, babies from coffins. The other um, titles around the world, Japanese, it was called Blizzard and Sacrifice, and in Norwegian and Swedish, it was called The Sacrificial Gift. As I mentioned, this did hit uh, Netflix on the 24th of July, 2020. It was filmed across Spain, including places such as Barcelona uh, in August of 2018. This did have one win at the um, Saint or Sant Jordi Awards for Patria, Patricia Lopez Anais for the Best Actress in a Spanish Film. So did re- receive an award. Um, which is interesting, I guess. But what are the critics and audiences saying for this one? I think it's a bit bit of a mixed bag, not necessarily positive. On Rotten Tomatoes, sits at 50%. That's rotten. That's only on six critic reviews. Audience a bit lower at 38%. That's on less than 50 ratings, though. If we jump over to IMDb, it's got a bit over 7,000 ratings. Sits at a 6.2 out of 10, so a little bit higher. Letterboxd, 2.9 out of 5 on nearly 4,000 ratings, but it's been logged by nearly 5,500 people. So what are my early thoughts on this one? I guess, I mean, like I sort of pretexted this already, but I haven't seen the previous two films. I know they're on Netflix. They had these theatrical releases in Spain, like I mentioned. So they're not Netflix originals. And as I said too, I didn't know that this was the last film in a trilogy. So as I said, the, the gist of this is that people kill babies and they become rich and successful after it. And I mean, the one thing that you need to do when making a series is obviously you gotta be faithful to the original, um, you know, the original product the novels which is going to, you know, please fans. Uh, but you also, if you're making film medium, you also need to make it accessible for those who have no background of the story, haven't read the novels, haven't seen the previous two films. Unfortunately, this doesn't know how to do it, which makes it really hard viewing. So for me, this uh, coming into it, not knowing any context about the novels or the other two films, this was a really hard watch. Uh, let's talk about the characters. So um, Amaya is our main character. She's, I think she's the main lead from all films. She's this cop. She loves investigating. She's a good cop. She works hard. Obviously has issues with her mother. Uh, from what I gather, her mother died in one of the previous films, but there's no body found. So this film is about Amaya not letting go. And, um, and and there's a chance too that her own mother tried to get rid of her own child at some stage in the previous films, which is sort of touched on. So obviously a bit of um, bit of mummy issues there. Amaya's got this twin sister um, who was one of the babies that was killed 
um, in the previous films, I think. And, um, you know, Amay as a, as a human being, she's super absent and horrible to her husband. She's, she's bonking the judge, um, which, which makes her extremely hard to like, especially with the excessive sobbing and crying we see from her throughout this film. So that made it hard for me. I'm talking about her husband, James, here. Uh, he's this stay-at-home dad who, uh, you know, he's oblivious to the fact that his wife is not faithful. And, you know, it's, he's got a bit of trauma himself because we find out that his dad's unwell, so he needs to go back to the States to visit him, and he wants a mayor to come, and she keeps putting it off because she's so into this case. And the, the, the issue with him as a character was, in this film, he, he speaks English. Um, he only speaks English in the movie, but the way that he speaks English makes it almost seem like he isn't speaking English. And because Netflix are so bad with their international films and their subtitles, every time he speaks, there's no subtitles because he's speaking in English. I mean, this really, really frustrates me. Just like, imagine if you are a deaf person and you are trying to watch this film, you'd lose the whole context of every line of dialogue from this character, it's so poor. Um, so all I could really take from his dialogue, I guess, was that he loves her and and has no idea what she's doing behind his back, which is really sad. Uh, Javier uh, Marquina, he's the, this is a spoiler, obviously, he's, he's the um, the judge that Amay is sort of obsessed with, and, and he's the guy that's actually pulling all the strings behind this cult in the movie, so spoiler, but he's the bad guy. Um, we got um, Jonan, who's Amaya's partner, he looks up to her, um, likes that she's her insta instinct, he's, he's a good person, unfortunately, he's a, he's a victim of um, her inabilities, I guess, throughout this film. The only other sort of characters we've got is there's this doctor who's this cult leader that apparently a mayor have caught in the previous film. He's in prison, gives her some clues. We've got Yolanda, who's this grief-stricken, raging mother of a victim who sort of plays a part in the middle of the film. And then Floris, who's a mayor's sister, and she doesn't like her sister because she won't move on from the mother's death. And, um, you know, obviously I've mentioned that Amaya thinks their mother's still alive, so that's the issue they've got as sisters. Uh, other than that, there's a whole bunch of other characters, especially detectives that work alongside a mayor. Yeah, that's where we're at. Um, the director, Fernando Gonzalez Molina. He, he's directed the two previous films in his series, but best known for a film called Palm Trees in the Snow, which uh, was pretty successful at the Spanish, at a whole bunch of Spanish film awards. So maybe that's one worth checking out. Time to talk about some scenes. What are some things that I like, things that I didn't like? I think the first thing I start off with is that this film, it looked pretty good, a majority of the film, except there's the, whenever Amaya goes outside into the streets, they, they use this red tinge that just wasn't needed. But apart from that, this film was shot really well. It looked really good. Now I'm going to talk about things that I didn't like. I think the opening scene, we see a man smothering a baby with a teddy bear. This, this is enough to turn anyone off a film. It sets it up really poorly, and I'm just like, why would I want to watch a film where this is the opening thing that I see? Uh, so that, that sort of threw me off to start with. There's a scene where Amaya gets out of her car. Um, the judge that was spoken about, she's having an affair with, he's there waiting for her, tells her that you know he cares about her. And then there's this random shot of her husband, James, just driving past watching. I thought that was hilarious. Really funny. <laughs> Then talking about, I've mentioned this anyway, James, her husband, every single scene with him, because I couldn't understand what he was saying, even though it was in English, I have to put that in there. There was this scene where it just started snowing, they're driving, and this, the snow just looks so fake, so CGI. That was horrible. Uh, her uh, Amaya's partner, Jonan, um, he, he gets killed, and every time she goes back to his house, Amaya, and looks at the photos of him, and gets upset, or touches the photos, just super lame. Uh, the fact that a Maya meets Jonan's husband after he dies and introduces himself as Mark. And she's like, oh, I had no idea that you had a partner. How, how do you work with someone every single day as your partner and not know that they've actually got someone in their outside life? I thought that was a horrendous, horrendous storyline. Um, a Maya, anytime she's on her phone, walking the streets, um, you know, like that hazy red street, or lying in bed, or crying, or weeping, these were all horrible, horrible, horrible. It could have been cut down so much, this film. There's just pointless scenes. Um, a Maya's auntie comforts her about, you know, well, sorry, confronts her about not, you know, loving her husband. Why don't you love your husband? And then we just cut to Maya lying in bed, holding his pillow and tossing and turning. Thought that was lame. And finally, the, the, the big twist in this film, I guess, or the multiple clues about Makina being bad, um, meaning that the reveal was pointless because we'd already seen this coming. And uh, best of all, they have this big lightning strike to even further highlight it at one stage. I just thought that was really poorly done. Uh, what's this film trying to say? Themes, ideas, that sort of stuff. So obviously the idea of redemption, she's got to let go of your mother, but also trying to be a mother yourself. And in this film, not, not a very good mother at all. Um, the idea of cults and the influence of cults, I guess. We've got victims being indoctrinated into things and how do you break that cycle. Uh, we do have a lot of strong femen uh, females in this film, strong women um, in this very male dominated field and obviously a lot of determination, a lot of persistence to be good at what you are doing. Um, 
All right, let's 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 keep going. So, what did I take away from this film? I think you know the, the, there is no situation where this film needed to be more than ninety minutes. This film is way too long. If you take out all those scenes, traveling in a car or walking down those streets or weeping and crying, you'd have a much tighter film that didn't rely on trying to fill in the gaps from the previous two films that, that still didn't fill in any gaps. Like, so it just didn't make sense to me. Um, I'm pretty frustrated with this film, to be honest. Questions, ponderings. Um, uh, these might be questions that can be answered by people who've seen the previous films. I don't think I'm gonna go back and watch them, to be honest. Uh, but like, why did Amaya have this, or need to have this need to have an affair with the judge? Like, was this from previous installments? Um, you know, he purposely didn't help her any further in her investigations. So it seemed pointless that she was actually having this affair with him when it seemed like her husband was a really nice guy. So don't know, don't have an answer. Um, and we, I mentioned at the start that we've got these cult members that become rich from doing what they were told to do in this cult and killing little innocent children. So where was this money coming from? Where were they being funded? How, how were they making this money? I, I don't have an answer for that either. And then the, the big question, I guess, is that is Amaya's mother actually dead? She doesn't believe she's dead. Is she actually dead? I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm ready to wrap this up. I think, uh, you know, I, I can't recommend this film. I mean, it looks good at times, but there's just so much going on that the film feels pointless, and, and I don't care for the main protagonist. Maybe if I had watched the previous films, uh, I would have got more of the pain that she feels about her mother, but if that's the case, you would expect her to do everything she possibly could do to redeem herself in this film and be a good mother herself, which she doesn't do. She doesn't spend time with her kids. She doesn't spend time with her husband. So, I mean, she's unfaithful, and... Uh, she actually let so many people die that work alongside her. So, and again, that twist, it's just not clever or good, and it's not a good reveal, and I feel like I walk away from this with very, very little. So I think this is a one and a half out of five. Pretty low for me. We're on socials. We are on X now, formerly known as Twitter, on <laughs> Facebook and Instagram. Give us a follow. Give us a like if you can. Question I wanted to put out there is, uh, are the first two films worth a watch? Are they they worth watching? Um, I, mean, I know I'll be watching them out of order, but are they something that I should go back and it'd give me a bit more context around this one? But other than that, I don't think I could put the time and effort into it, to be honest. Um, we're back next week. Next week, we have a teen romantic comedy from 2020. It's called The Kissing Booth 2. Oh, a sequel to uh, a film that we did quite a while ago, the original Kissing Booth. Uh, this is directed by Vince Marcello, stars Joey King, Joel Courtney, and Jacob Lordy. Get on board. Um, from memory, I wasn't a huge fan of the first one, so let's see if the, the second one picks it up next week. As always, thanks for hanging around, and I'll see you next week.